I think that this idea, though, really sort of catapults us into the last sort of area I wanted to talk about in the philosophy of science, and that's scientific realism. So I'm wondering, one, how you just generally understand the term, but I think your characterization or the word you just used a, a minute ago of a guess versus certain proof that you get in mathematics sort of raises the question of scientific realism and what we should be committed to. Yeah. Okay. So let me, and again, I, I listened to your interview with boss and, and this was again, a kind of thing that I just, I, I quite honestly don't understand what he has in mind. So he, let's just talk about the term scientific realism, right? Boss said something like, oh, the scientific realist believes that the aim of science is truth. And the constructive empiricist thinks it's not, right? The aim of science is just having an empirically adequate theory or something like that. I don't even know, what do you mean by the aim of science? I mean, science is some you know huge activity that all these people are engaged in in different ways with different purposes. Science doesn't have an aim or a purpose. It's not the right kind of thing to have an aim or a purpose, right? Individual scientists may have aims or purposes. And I'll tell you, a bunch of them were interested in finding the truth, right? Maybe not all of them, but the ones I like were, you know. So, you know, I, th this just strikes me as being very strange. I, the way I use the term, maybe other people don't. The way I've always understood the term, is it, it, it's a term of art in confirmation theory. And it, you, you begin with a kind of at least rough and ready distinction, which was the one that Carnap and everybody else was using then, between what's just immediately observable and what is theoretical in that, in that you make some postulate that goes beyond immediate observation, like the atomic theory of matter, for example. And what the scientific realist believes is that at least in some cases, the evidence for a non-observable claim can be strong enough and compelling enough. It's not a proof. It's not a demonstration. You're always a fallibilist about this, right? I mean, you, you always say, yeah, maybe, maybe next year this all will be thrown over. But nonetheless, you think that the evidence for a, a, a theoretical claim can at least sometimes be strong enough to properly warrant what we would call belief. Okay? I believe that water is H2O, that it, it's made up of an, an oxygen, atom and two hydrogen atoms bound together. I believe that. And it's not something I can immediately observe. It is by anybody's standard of what counts as a theoretical claim, a theoretical claim. I believe that matter is in an appropriate sense atomic. This is what Feynman said. If you could only tell there was going to be some cataclysm and you could only give one sentence to the people who survive, matter is made of atoms. That's what he said. He believed that. I believe that. That's not an observational claim. I mean, there was all kinds of disputes for Aristotle. They couldn't just look and see. But when you think about the evidence that we had for water being H2O, when you think about the evidence that we have for matter having an atomic structure, when you think about the evidence that we have for, I don't know, you know, stars being fueled by fusion, I think that you're warranted it is uh, the appropriate epistemic stance is to believe those things, not, you know, beyond all possible doubt, but okay, we all learn that after reading Meditation One. <laughs> you know, if you set your standard too high, then you won't believe anything. Okay, you're just going to be a skeptic, right? That's just a different deal. But I would, you know, and, and, and to me, that's scientific realism. Now, scientific realism does not say as I understand it, that every interesting theoretical claim will eventually meet this standard of either being accepted, you know, rationally acceptable or rationally rejectable. Some may never, you know, you just, there may never be enough evidence to decide. That's perfectly compatible as far as I'm concerned with scientific realism. But the scientific realist does believe at least sometimes <laughs> the evidence is really strong enough to warrant belief, where belief is you certainly at least think something is more likely than not and you know some probably slightly higher standard and as so stated i don't understand how anybody could fail to be a scientific realist it's like you don't believe water's h2o you don't believe that stars are driven by by fusion i i don't get it 
Now, I assume they must have something else in mind if they say they're not scientific realists, but then they have to explain it to me with at least as much clarity as I just explained to you what why I am one. Well, in a second, I'll play devil's advocate because something came to mind where there might be a good example. But one thing that I've been very surprised in, because lately I've been reading a lot of history of science, and I'm surprised by how often physicists, uh, by my judgment, do not seem to be aiming at the truth. And this might get to or anticipate our discussion in half an hour, an hour about the John Bell Institute. But a lot of physicists, it seems, are not interested in understanding quantum mechanics at what I would think of as its deepest level. They're interested in producing a theory that accurately predicts observations, but they their why questions stop at a level before mine would. Yeah. I mean, let, let me just I don't say, know if you I, agree I'm not even disagree. going to disagree with that, but you have to be very clear. You've been reading about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is just this weird, horrible aberration in the history of science and certainly in the history of physics. I mean, you know, Newton was trying to figure stuff out. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and Lavoisier and Franklin and Maxwell and Boltzmann, it, you know, I mean, they, go read them. Yes, quantum mechanics screws everything up. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and physicists who are talking about quantum mechanics because it all got messed up by Bohr and all this stuff. And, you know, we could go in a little bit into, into what happened there. But what happened there was a, a, an incredible sickness. I mean, there's this quote, you can find it of Lakatos. I mean, Shelley Goldstein quotes this a lot. There's a quote of Lakatos about how... Um, uh, it, 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 at the at the time in the 1920s, I don't know what does he say. Ordinary language and, and something come together and, and created the the the, mo the worst catastrophe. I'm not getting the exact quote. Right? It's a wonderful quote in the you know in the history of time. The, 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 the greatest lowering of critical standards in history happened in physics around quantum mechanics. But if you want, you know, go 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 read the people who will explain general relativity to you. They're, they're just going to tell you, look, this is according to the theory, this is how it works. And they have a very clear picture of it. And if they're good, they can even explain how the math is getting at that. And they'll explain what they mean by the curvature of space and time. And they'll explain, give you examples about how the curvature of space and time could explain things like orbits and, you know, balls falling off of the leaning tower of Pisa and all this stuff. And they believe it. Um, so I... Right. Do not, I mean, absolutely do not just look at quantum mechanics and then generalize even for physics off of that. Mm -hmm. Well, it does extend to other areas like string theory, for example. Well, str <laughs> okay. I mean, now it's that, getting that, even worse because string theory never had any really good empirical evidence in its favor. There were certain conceptual, conceptual issues it could help clear up. I mean, I understand. I've talked a bit and heard him talk, but also talk directly to Ed Witten about it. And I, I appreciate what he found attractive about it, but it never had any direct empirical evidence. I mean, if you asked Witten at a certain time, you'd say, well, what is, is there any empirical evidence? And he'd say gravity. And you kind of, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's like, oh, if you believe in gravity, you must believe in string theory. Now that's, that it doesn't work that way. Um, and, and there were various concept, you know, there were various kind of mathematical conceptual issues, if it had worked out, that would have been cleared up. And the original hope was to have an extremely constrained theory, so there was basically only one one version of it. And then it turns out there, you know, this whole landscape of hundreds of billions of different string theories with all these different parameters. Anyway, that's that's another story. But yeah, I, I mean. If thinking about quantum mechanics is bad, string, <laughs> string theory is even worse. However, let me just suggest that you, if, if you're reading about string theory, see, see how often string theorists would talk in a, very, in a way that suggests that they were proposing this as a true theory. They would say, look, what's an electron really? Oh, it's a little wiggly string. In fact, 
there are these strings and they can vibrate. And when they vibrate this way, they're electrons. And when they vibrate that way, they're muons. And when they vibrate this way, you know, they're gluons or whatever. That's like Thales, man. I mean, that's like a pre-Socratic. <laughs> Ultimately, there are these strings and, and, and they just have different behaviors, right? And all these, this, this, this zoo of different particles that you think of as being different things are really at the underlying level, just vibrating strings. They certainly say stuff like that. That's an exciting proposal. You'd like good evidence, you know, to take it seriously. Hmm. Well, my sort of devil's advocate that I wanted to play, my cat's being a bit recalcitrant and wants to wants to be uh, hogging all the limelight. But I think what you said a few minutes ago at the outset of your response about scientific realism was that if we have a, a very well worked out theory with extremely strong evidential support for a non observable claim, then that should be sufficient to properly warrant our belief in that. Let, in, let, let me just non stop you before you go on. The example I gave you was water is H2O. I, I, I mean, I don't think of yes. that as being in, in a certain sense, a well worked out theory. And the re in fact, the reason I would bet in a hundred year, a hundred thousand years, if humans are still around, they'll still be saying water is H two O, is because it's not exactly a detailed theory. It's just okay. You've got an oxygen, whatever that is, and two hydrogens, whatever that is, <laughs> hydrogen atoms, and they're bonded. However, that works. Now, the nice thing about it not being so detailed is that it then is it, it can survive changes in the account of what oxygen is and hydrogen is and bonding is, but it still might, it's still going to come out at the end of the day that water is an oxygen bonded to two hydrogens, right? So in terms of confirm, and this is the normal thing in confirmation theory, kind of the less detailed the hypothesis, the stronger the evidence can be for it. The more detailed the hypothesis, the harder it is to get really strong evidence for. Well, this this isn't where I was going, but just to better understand what you're saying, if if it were to be somehow empirically confirmed that the water was those molecules are ultimately composed of strings, you would still say that water is still composed of water H2O. Is H2O. That you're not going to okay. change the chemistry books. They didn't have to change that part of chemistry you know, because of quantum mechanics or discovering gluons or discovering quarks or whatever, they, they got more information about what hydrogen is and more information about what oxygen is. But none of that touched the basic claim that what water is, is a molecule consisting of one oxygen bonded to two hydrogens. Yeah. Okay. That's, well, that's here why I, I believe it. Right. I mean, if you got, if you, if you specified details in a great degree about exactly what hydrogen is, exactly what oxygen, then I'd become more and more skeptical, right? I'd say, no, nah, I don't, you know, I, I, I think all of those details you're giving me, those might be wrong. That's what I'm saying. I mean, there are certain levels of explanation. You know, in some sense, the theory of evolution isn't going to go away. Now, it's changed a lot, and there have been lots of, you know, adjustments in it over time. But the basic picture of evolution, as opposed to, you know, divine uh, uh creation of design that that's still there because because it's much it, it's not so specific right it's much more kind of yeah well okay here's where i was going with this and it's a genuine question i have so i'm sure you'll be able to help me make sense of it but we shouldn't have a warrant for mutually contradictory beliefs and Take, for instance, I mean, our two best, two of our best confirmed theories. I mean, there's quantum field theory for the microscopic and general relativity for the massive and microscopic. But we know that they're in conflict and that changes must be made for there to be a coherent unified theory. But it seems like if we're, adopt, if we're to adopt the position of the scientific realist, we should accept the frameworks and postulated workings of two theories that we know to be mutually incompatible. And it doesn't seem like there should be a warrant for that. 
Yeah, but th that's not. Uh, you, you see, there there are a couple different moving pieces here. Let me. It's one I I had in mind all along, but I didn't mention. So. One way in which a scientific realist, you, you're, you're not going to be a scientific realist if you demand proof, demonstration, right? You know, you're, you better be a fallibilist. So there's a question of, of how, how much evidence, you know, as it were, how much uh, subjective probability you, you should expect to, to where you say you're now willing to say, okay, I believe this. So that's, that's one parameter. But the other thing is often the this isn't true for the H2O case, but for the case of quantum field theory or whatever. Of course, the rational view is to say, I don't believe this theory is exactly exactly right, right? And now you get this pessimistic meta-induction, right? I, I, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons, just internal reasons for thinking that, for example, quantum field theory can't be exactly right. It has all these problems with infinities, okay? There's kind of a normalization where people put in cutoffs. So they do stuff that looks kind of unprincipled. So what do you believe? You believe it's approximately true, right? Now, the thing about H2O is that it's very hard to understand, well, what would you mean to say it's approximately true that water's H2O? It seems like either, either it's dead on or it's just wrong, right? But for lots of other things, I, I mean, it, it, you can make perfectly, perfectly good sense of saying of certain things they're approximately true, but of course not exactly true. And one thing you, you're saying is, do I have good warrant to believe that this is approximately true? Now, there are going to be all kinds of considerations of what kind of approximation you have in mind. And there's not a blanket answer to that. Um, and, and then there's even a, a further fallback position, which I'll just mention. Maybe you don't want to call this scientific realism, although it kind of... I, I, I would be willing to put it in the class of scientific realism, where you say, okay, here's a theory, here's the evidence, the theory has some problems, we know about those, There's, it, it makes a bunch of very good predictions, but there are these and these problems, maybe it makes some bad predictions, maybe it has some internal problems, whatever. And then you make a judgment and you say, you know, but I think this is a step in the right direction, okay? That is, I think... This theory, even though I don't believe it, right? I don't think it's exactly right. I, it's got all kinds of problems with it. I think the, the route that will get us to a correct theory runs through this one. Yeah? So I think you should spend your time working on this theory, trying to clean it up, thinking hard about it, thinking about how it works. I think there's a lot of, as it were, riches embedded in this theory, even though it's not accurate entirely, but it's a step in the right direction. Now, it, it does, it, and, you know, does that, is that a scientific realist or not? I'm not, you know, now it, it is a kind of belief that the theory is getting at something right, but getting at is a bit vague, right? It's giving you something in the right neighborhood. It's giving you some mot, some structures that you know, some relations between things. I mean, the, this is where um, epistemic structural realism, I'm sure you're familiar with, as opposed to ontic structural realism, it seemed to me was exactly the right thing to say. Was, was Maxwell's account of electromagnetism right? Well, no, not really. I mean, once you have, you know, quantum electrodynamics, you're going to say Maxwell's picture of the electromagnetic fields aren't right. But there was a heck of a lot in Maxwell's equations of that structure that, that even from the point of view of the successor theory, that structure or something very near that structure remains. It's not like you just threw it all away and started it on an entirely different basis. And so this idea of a, 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 a useful way forward, right? A, 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 a series of theories that are better and better getting you closer to the truth or, you know, this idea of verisimilitude, right? Those are hard things. I don't think they have a clean formal analysis, but I don't think you can get rid of them entirely either. They're a little vague, but they're useful, and I think they're the right way to think about science.